I would like to give a, uh, an overview of the special senses of smell and taste. Uh, they are special senses because they're only perceived in one place of the body. So smell obviously from the nose, taste from the mouth and throat, um, as opposed to something like pain or temperature, which is felt all over the place. And unlike the general senses like pain, temperature, which go to the somatosensory cortex of uh, the brain, um, each of these has its own special part of the brain where it's processed. Now, I'd like to just begin with a little background on smell. Smell is incredibly important, um, but not so much for humans. Uh, mammals primarily are nocturnal. The majority of mammals come out uh, at night. Even early primates, um, some of the, the prosimian, some of the New World monkeys even, uh, are nocturnal. And uh, for nocturnal animals, vision isn't all that you know, uh, valuable. Uh, so therefore smell is incredibly important. And um, so therefore, as I'll show in a second, the olfactory receptors, there's more than a thousand of them as far as genes in the, the human genome and the mammalian genome. That's an incredible number given that we only have about say 25,000 genes total. So, you know, this number is huge, um, indicating, you know, the, the incredible um, value that uh, uh, we uh, place on, uh, on the sense uh, of a uh, smell, or at least that mammals uh, do. Um, however, as primates evolved and then became more and more interested in, uh, in vision, uh, then a lot of these genes then uh, mutated and apparently it didn't matter much. Uh, and so therefore, while we have close to a thousand genes for olfactory receptors, we only use about half of them. Half of them are essentially broken pseudogenes. So our sense of smell is nowhere uh, uh, what it once was in typical mammals and then ancestral um, uh, ancestral uh, primates. Um, now, specifically olfactory receptors and taste, or most of the taste receptors, belong to a gene family known as the G protein coupled receptors. So what they do, this is the largest gene family in the human genome. What a G protein coupled receptor does is it binds to something on the outside of the cell and then it activates a G protein on the inside of the cell, which then turns on another molecule, like a second messenger, and there are a couple second messengers. Uh, and so now the inside of the cell changes as a result of something which uh, was on the outside of the cell and interacted with this uh, GPCR. Now, uh, that's a great mechanism, linking a, a stimulus on the outside of the cell to something on uh, the inside. And so that's why in um, the human genome, there's, you know, a thousand of these because, you know, they duplicated, they duplicated. And so now some of these react to hormones, some of these react to signals from immune uh, cells. Uh, but then also these include the olfactory receptors, and then also most of the taste receptors, say for sweet, um, uh, bitter and uh, umami are these G-protein coupled uh, uh, receptors. Uh, once again, uh, we have this incredible diversity uh, of genes for them, half of which are broken because apparently we don't rely on our um, sense of smell uh, the way that uh, ancestral mammals did. Now, it's very difficult to study these. And so obviously I'll, I'll move on um, simply because unlike in the eye, uh, where there are uh, different cells, uh, one responds to light in black and dark, that's a rod, and one responds to light in color, it's a cone, and the cells actually look different. Um, in, the, uh, in the nose, in the olfactory epithelium, you, know, you can see an olfactory uh, neuron, a uh, receptor, but it doesn't look different from the neighboring one. Um, and so which ones are smelling vanilla versus which ones are smelling spaghetti sauce versus which ones are smelling, you know, cheese versus which ones. And unlike colors where there's primary colors that you can combine, you know, we could ask the question, how many primary smells are there? So smell is fascinating, but it's, uh, uh, it's uh, complex. Now on the, um, olfactory uh, neurons. Those G-protein couple of receptors are actually located on a cilium. 
Now, when we talk about cilia, I, obviously there are cells of the body which have lots of cilia, like those in the throat or those of the oviduct. But most cells have one, all right? So a cilium is not something which is rare in the body. There's what's known as a primary cilium um, that most cells have. And it's an important, uh, you know, uh, especially in development, you know, it kind of orients the cell. I, I mean, I like to think of it like as a compass needle. So like, you know, cells can figure out like direction and use it. And there are mutations which affect the primary cilium, which can cause uh, diseases. Um, this is where the olfactory receptors are um, uh, expressed. Um, but then these can be modified. So um, it is a primary cilium, uh, which is... Um, uh, used uh, in this bipolar uh, uh, neuron as a, a sensory structure. And then also a modified primary cilium, which is used in say uh, cells of the eye uh, to make rods and, uh, and cones. And, and so um, uh, uh, once again, uh, that's an interesting thing about cilia, where we think of these uh, in say the throat or the oviduct, which are, are creating a current, um, but uh, typically cells have a primary cilium and, cilium and it can be sensory as in, in the eye and in, uh, and in the nose. Okay. So uh, going to the olfactory epithelium uh, in uh, the uh, area of the uh, nasal uh, conchi, uh, uh, right in here. And as we'll see, all of these little holes, uh, these holes in a part of the ethmoid bone called the cribriform plate. These are the holes for the olfactory nerves known as the olfactory foramina. So this is the internal base of the skull. Um, so this is where the nerves would come from the olfactory bulb in the brain. And so, and this is where they would leave and then service an area known as the olfactory epithelium, which would be about a square inch. Now that's nothing compared to say, you know, a German shepherd would have an olfactory epithelium maybe 72 times uh, that size and therefore be far more sensitive to smell. So when we think of the uh, nasal uh, cavity, once again, we have this area known as the olfactory epithelium, okay? And uh, this is where we have uh, the cells which are capable of, uh, of detecting scent. So there are uh, supporting cells um, there are uh, then uh, stem cells, uh, which um, are, are going to uh, divide and then produce olfactory neurons. Um, now, uh, what's odd about this is in many, in most parts of uh, the brain, uh, nerve cells are no longer capable of being produced. There's no cell division uh, uh, producing uh, nerve cells, which is a main reason I don't want to have a stroke. Like if I cut my skin, I'll just make more skin cells and, and repair myself. But if I have a stroke and uh, cells in the brain die, most can't ever be replaced. There's a little cell division which can occur in the brain. Um, but then as a result, I would have permanent deficits. Um, but the olfactory neurons are regenerated constantly, maybe about once a month. And so while uh, cell uh, division occurs almost nowhere in uh, the brain. In the nose, it occurs all the time. That also makes it difficult to study, like how is it that we smell? Which cells are detecting, say, vanilla? How do we detect vanilla? Is it one vanilla neuron? No, we don't think so. Uh, so it's probably a combination. Well, what combination produces uh, uh, vanilla. Uh, well, if the cells are constantly changing, you know, dying and being replaced once a month, obviously this makes it uh, difficult to uh, study uh, them. So uh, here in this olfactory epithelium, we have all of this uh, cell uh, uh, division, which is uh, interesting. Um, from this primary uh, cilium, uh, then they have uh, olfactory uh, hairs, uh, which uh, uh, will detect the, uh, the odorants. Now, the odorants um, are going to uh, be dissolved in this mucus, all right? So we have um, uh, uh, this mucus, which is going to dissolve uh, the, uh, odor, uh, the odorants. So here we have um, the receptors are located on uh, the cilia uh, from the dendrite. 
and the uh, odorants then will bind to those G protein coupled uh, receptors here. Uh, and these glands are then serving two functions. So one, uh, this mucus, uh, so the gland which is making this uh, mucus, uh, this is dissolving the odorants, so uh, that allows them to be perceived, but then also they will wash the odorants away. So when you uh, walk into a room, you might be struck by the smell of something, you know, that had just come out of the oven. Um, but not only would we adapt to this over time and become less responsive, uh, but the mucus then will wash over uh, this and then wash the odorants away. So then it would just end up in mucus, which is swallowed into the throat. Uh, and so those olfactory glands help us to dissolve the odorant so we can smell it, you know, the first time and then wash it uh, away. And so this is what uh, the olfactory epithelium, once again, an area of about uh, a square inch, looks like uh, over uh, the, uh, uh, the nasal uh, conchi in uh, the roof of the nasal cavity. Now, these bipolar neurons then have, uh, in addition to one dendrite, uh, they have one axon, um, which will then uh, project through those holes in the ethmoid bone, those olfactory foramina. Now, uh, a lot of nerves, you know, are these large structures, like, so we have two optic nerves, which crisscross and go to the eyes, but, you know, one optic nerve goes to the left eye. Um, in contrast, we have lots of olfactory nerves going through all of those little holes in the cribriform uh, uh, plate. Uh, so <clears throat> all of these axons uh, do not uh, unite uh, to form, you know, one big olfactory nerve. Uh, so instead, there's lots of uh, these uh, olfactory uh, nerves, which then go to a part of the brain known as the olfactory bulb, where they synapse. And then from the olfactory bulb, uh, neurons will project to the olfactory cortex in what's known as the olfactory tract. So here in the nasal cavity, there's the olfactory epithelium, um, and then the axons of the olfactory nerves reach the olfactory bulb, which then projects uh, to that uh, olfactory, uh, uh, to uh, the olfactory tract. So here's the underside of a human brain, and here's this olfactory bulb on the underside of the cerebrum. So the olfactory nerves would come from here and go through um, that cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Uh, and the olfactory tract, which will lead then to the brain, uh, is located here. Uh, now notice this is smaller in size, you know, here in comparison is the optic nerve coming from uh, the eye. Um, but it should be uh, pointed out that, you know, um, as primates evolve, so as you go from the early, you know, more primitive primates uh, to uh, the monkeys, to the catarine uh, primates, to the apes, to humans, this olfactory bulb gets smaller and smaller. And then an ex there's another structure known as an accessory ol olfactory bulb, which essentially disappears. If you look, say, at a sheep, the olfactory bulb is far, far larger. And if you look at fish, uh, the cerebrum you know, a very large portion of it is based on smell. So smell was once so very important, but, you know, here the olfactory bulb, you know, is just a fraction of the size, you know, that it once uh, was. The genes, the genes which are uh, being used as olfactory receptors are just a fraction of, you know, the original mammalian repertoire. We've lost about half of them as these mutated pseudogenes. Um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, olfaction uh, is then uh, unique because once again, it used to be such a significant part of the brain. It is the only sense that doesn't go through the thalamus. All of the general senses, go to the thalamus before being projected to the somatosensory cortex. Vision, hearing, um, and taste all go to the thalamus and some other parts of the, the uh, brain, uh, the brain, the other uh, brainstem regions such as the midbrain um, before going to the cerebral cortex. Smell is the only sense that goes directly in. And so, you know, we could talk about interesting things such as, you know, the links between smell and emotion. Um, because uh, this sense of smell is going directly in uh, to the brain and synapses with a number of um, 
limbic regions. So I'm sure we could think of sounds which really don't affect us one way or another or sights, um, but a lot of smells do. We either like the smell or we don't like uh, uh, the smell. A lot of times smell, uh, smell can trigger a memory um, uh, in uh, a way that you know, we don't get from uh, other uh, uh, senses. Uh, and so once again, uh, it is the only sense which goes directly into the cerebrum and therefore there are some you know, interesting aspects there. So uh, we have the olfactory nerves, which we label as cranial nerve one, going into the olfactory bulb, into the olfactory tract. And then if we were to look at the mid-sagittal section of the brain, all right, so this is along the midline, and we make the diencephalon go away, then there is an olfactory cortex. But once again, we wouldn't see it from the lateral side. You would only see it from the uh, medial uh, side. And so this is then where uh, the olfactory tract uh, would uh, uh, project. So thus, this is a special sense. Unlike the general senses, which project to the somatosensory cortex, smell has its own specific part of the uh, brain. And then from the olfactory cortex, there can be uh, projections into neighboring regions, uh, many of which are involved in the limbic system. So once again, smells can trigger uh, uh, emotions and uh, smell can trigger memories, given that you know, nearby sites such as the amygdala and hippocampus are involved in uh, memory. All right. So that is our main sense of smell. Um, but we have to continue with smell, but take an unexpected side road. So if you were to look at how these uh, uh, buffalo are greeting each other, well, they're, they're sniffing each other. And uh, actually the buffalo are going to the point where uh, the female is making urine that the male will then sample and make you know this grimace while it does. That's a, a typical um, uh, uh, response. Um, and so one could ask what is going on there because obviously dogs greet each other um, by sniffing each other uh, as, uh, as well. What is going on there? Once again, for mammals, smell is a really important sense and we lose appreciation for that because in primates and certainly higher primates, we've lost so much of it. And so one of the things that smell allows individuals to do is to communicate with other members of your group. So when dogs meet each other, they sniff each other and they learn so much. So not only can they distinguish between you know, males and uh, females, um, but they would know uh, because, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me just stop. And, and the, the reason that this is effective is because we make pheromones. There are apocrine sweat glands, which we have in our bodies. Now, different mammals put them on different regions of the body. So they can be more in uh, the anal region. They can be more you know, on the, the forearm, uh, even in uh, some primates, I believe. Um, in humans, uh, they are primarily located in the armpits, but also around the groin and around the nipples. Uh, this sweat gland produces a modified type of sweat. Um, uh, which then gets broken down by bacteria to produce odorants. So body odor is something that we make on purpose. Sweat doesn't have to have odor. It doesn't. But uh, it does because we purposely put uh, chemicals in our sweat, which when broken down, produce uh, odor. Why would we you know, purposely make body odor? And the reason is primarily to communicate with other members of our group. Now, remember that most mammals, the majority are nocturnal, right? So once again, vision, so facial expression, you know, that's not effective for most mammals, smell is. So these pheromones not only allow you to distinguish between males and females, which are making different pheromones, but say a female in estrus would make different pheromones than a female who wasn't in uh, estrus. Um, now, even though pheromones have a much lesser role in uh, people, as I will uh, get into, um, we apparently still do this. So this goes back, you know, decades. It was, you know, known and studied that women uh, who live together often find that their menstrual cycles come in sync. How is that possible? Well, there was a study, and this was the first one to show this, uh, where a woman slept in a t-shirt 
And then the next morning, she you know, gave the t-shirt to a study group of women and just the, the shirt went down the line and everyone took a smell. And the women uh, who smelled the shirt noticed that their menstrual cycles came in sync with the woman whose shirt that was. So it was shown that it was an odorant. So uh, women make different pheromones at different points of uh, the uh, menstrual cycle. And even though it's obviously not a conscious production or a conscious perception, other women can then respond uh, to this and actually then change their own physiology um, uh, to, uh, to match it. Um, so men and women, and there are lots of psychology studies that, that do this where you know, someone is you know, in a, breathing through an apparatus where they are taking in uh, pheromones. And they can say, let's say you're judging, you know, images or making some decision on a screen. Um, you can note a difference when you're breathing in, you know, pheromone A as opposed to pheromone B. So it, uh, these pheromones uh, affect us, uh, although no, to nowhere near the same degree as they do other mammals, as I'll, as I'll get into. Um, so these dogs, uh, they know males uh, from females. They can tell whether the female is in estrus or not. In the males, they can tell, is this the alpha male who wins all his fights? Is this the beta male who wins almost all his fights? Is this the zeta male who loses all uh, his uh, uh, fights, etc.? Is this individual sick? All right. Um, so our, uh, our body odor can change when we're ill. Back in the day, this was you know, maybe centuries ago, but that was considered to be one of the, the skills a physician had, that they could walk into a house of a sick person and the, the, the type of odor you know, that was there that would help them diagnose. Now, I, I'm not sure about that, but you know, we certainly, we, we do change our body odor when, um, when we are uh, ill. Um, one other fascinating thing about uh, these um, apocrine sweat, uh, sweat productions, they can vary based on a set of proteins called our MHC proteins, our cell ID badges, which we use to match uh, tissue compatibility. In other words, we vary um, in our body odor based on our heritage. So this could be you know, our family, our ethnic group, uh, our larger group, etc. Now, um, mice can distinguish between other mice, um, which are identical, but vary in the MHC protein. So the cell ID badges being similar or different changes their smell. And apparently humans can even distinguish between mice of these different strains. Um, and it seems humans as well. So uh, apparently, you know, studies if like, and I always say to my class, if we did a lab experiment where everyone produced the shirt that you slept in last night and you walked down the aisle and you took a, a smell of everybody's shirt and then you ranked them, this is the one I find least pleasant, you know, most offensive, or what, however you rate smells. This is the one I, I find, um, uh, you know, appealing, you know, et cetera. So you, you rate the sweat. If we were to then compare MHC proteins, you know, do some genetic analysis, um, we would find that we tend to prefer the sweat of those who are less closely related to us. Let me repeat that. So in animals and in humans, there seems to be an innate preference for the apocrine sweat of those which are less closely related to us. This seems to be more important uh, for women than for men uh, when, you know, gauging uh, interest or attraction. Um, but one of the things that this would do, you know, say among these dogs, is it would um, increase the likelihood that dogs would partner with uh, those which were less closely related to them. In human terms, um, this would mean that if you were picking a significant uh, other, that that significant other would be more likely to be distantly related to you because you are less interested in the odor of the ones which are most closely related uh, to you. And here I'm just saying that it's only in the higher apes that uh, the axillary organ in the armpit is where these are uh, produced. Uh, these odorants, they can be produced lots of other body parts um, in other um, uh, in other animals. Now, um, this seems, you know, not very important in the modern world because if you were to, I don't know, you know, go to a party or a, re a restaurant or a bar 
or a dating app or whatever, and, and find you know, someone you dated, where did that person's ancestors come from? Well, clearly they could have come from a part of the world thousands of miles from where your ancestors came from. But think about your ancestors. They often lived in small villages, small tribes, small clans. Um, and in a small village, everybody's related to varying degrees. So as your ancestors became of dating age, most of the potential you know, matches were relatives of theirs. But if they have kind of an innate um, preference for the odor, for the, the body odor of those who are less closely related to them, that would um, encourage them to date non-relatives or more distant relatives. Uh, and once again, uh, that would then potentially limit uh, the genetic uh, diseases that might be in the offspring. So smelling pheromones is really important for mammals and it has lots of aspects in it. But while dogs greet each other by smelling each other, and obviously those buffalo did, humans don't, all right? Why is that? Well, a major reason is this. You actually have two senses of smell, two. There is the main olfactory system and the olfactory epithelium is here. You have a second sense of smell called the vomeronasal organ forming part of the vomeronasal uh, system. So in the vomer, that's the bone that makes up the lower part of the nasal septum. There's a little hole, all right, that leads then to a little tiny cylindrical organ, the vomeronasal organ, all right? And odorants then uh, reach it. And that's why that, um, that bison was making that face after sampling the urine of the female. It wasn't a grimace reflecting taste or distaste. It was trying to open the channel so that the odorants would then have access to the vomeronasal uh, organ. In mammals, and actually in all, you know, tetrapods, this is primarily where um, pheromones are detected. So interestingly, if a snake, when a snake sticks out its tongue, it's grabbing odorants in the air, and then the odorant then rubs it on the VNO, all right, and, or, uh, or introduces it into the vicinity. Uh, and so uh, this is a, a common thing. But in the higher primates, called the catarine primates, the ancestors of the apes and the old world monkeys, this broke. There was a mutation which then inactivated the um, uh, the vomeronasal organ. It was a mutation in a specific gene, the trip gene. So whether it be humans or chimps or orangutans or gibbons or old world monkeys like a you know a baboon, a, a mandrill, um, we all share the same mutation, which wiped out the system. The system no longer works. So while you have two senses of smell, one no longer works. So pheromones, the compounds in the sweat of other individuals, they don't have the same importance to humans as they do in more typical uh, mammals. And so, you know, as primates began to, to focus more and more on vision at the expense of smell, uh, smell decreased greatly in its importance as a sense. Now, I often just interesting, did it happen that way? The vision became more important and then thus mutations in um, the olfactory uh, systems uh, didn't matter? Or was it the reverse way? Was there a mutation in the olfactory systems, which meant that that sense was, was less useful, uh, which meant now that vision had to become more important? So, you know, that's, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, that being said, we, we still do perceive some pheromones be humans. Um, and so therefore this area has to be capable of detecting some. This was the area where most were detected. Uh, and so once again, there are you know, lots of psychological you know, uh, studies. It's interesting as far as you know, how humans react to uh, pheromones. You know, there are stories of you know, say uh, uh, you know, two people who date and if, if say a woman is on birth control, birth control changes perceptions of body odor. If, you know, these, you know, individuals end up in a long-term relationship, if the woman then had, had stopped taking birth control at some point, she may find, she might find that she really didn't like the odor of her partner for the first time. So, you know, there, there's, you know, we, we clearly react uh, to pheromones uh, in, um, uh, in body odor, but not uh, to the same degree as, you know, typical mammals do. So that was um, the, uh, the sense of 
uh, smell, and once again, that, that ability to perceive uh, pheromones no longer really functional. But interestingly, there is a cranial nerve that doesn't typically get numbered. So the olfactory uh, nerves are one, the optic nerves are two, but there is what's called a terminal nerve, which is called zero. Uh, in humans, it's really minor, um, uh, but it uh, in other animals includes that vomero nasal uh, system. Now, um, I, I here, uh, uh, going to the second uh, special uh, sense, uh, taste. So taste is perceived in uh, the mouth with these taste buds, which are primarily on the tongue, on these different uh, bumps on the tongue, these different papillae. Uh, and they can have a couple different shapes, but they're not unique to the tongue, um, where they can also be on the roof of the mouth and in uh, the pharynx, you know, maybe even on the epiglottis. Um, uh, and, you know, in other animals, like catfish have them all over their body. I mean, catfish have lots of taste buds. Um, so here is a bump on uh, the tongue that has uh, these uh, taste um, buds. Uh, it was, uh, there is some differentiation where the different tastes are. So bitter is more in the back of the mouth, sweet, salty, sour, more in the front of the mouth. Um, it was once thought that there were like sweet was only here and sour was only on the sides, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. So it seems that a taste bud is capable of not just being sweet versus salty, but you know, a, a taste bud can uh, recognize a, a multiple a taste. So there are basal cells, which then produce, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have supporting cells, um, but there are then gustatory uh, cells. Uh, these are the ones which will actually detect the taste, and they have a long microvillus, a long uh, structure uh, which uh, extends through an opening called a taste pore. And so when there's something in our mouths, which, we, you know, from the food we've eaten, uh, let's say the we call it a tastent, uh, it can bind receptors. Once again, those G protein coupled receptors, uh, which are on this uh, microvillus, uh, which will uh, then uh, cause an electrical change in this uh, cell. All right, so uh, the binding of the, um, uh, the receptor to a tastent then changes uh, this cell, and it can then make neurotransmitters. Now, um, you know, we're used to neurotransmitters being how, say, nerve cells communicate with other nerve cells or with muscle cells. But here you have an epithelial cell using nerve, uh, neurotransmitters to communicate with a nerve cell. So if these are the, uh, the axons, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the dendrites of uh, nerve cells. Um, they need to know when you've tasted something. So this epithelial cell talks to it. It releases a signal, these neurotransmitters, um, onto the sensory neurons, which can then carry the message that you've tasted something towards the brain. And so um, this is how uh, we detect uh, taste. Taste and bind to receptors on the microvillus of uh, these uh, gustatory uh, cells. They then make neurotransmitters onto the uh, uh, onto the uh, sensory uh, uh, sensory neurons. Now I'll talk about where this goes in just uh, a second. Um, but first of all, I, I want to be clear about what we mean by uh, taste. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to you know like ask a class is I like to ask. So for example, um, who knows what vanilla tastes like? Raise your hand. You know everyone thinks it's such a stupid question. You know, but some people will raise. Um, their hand. Who knows what, you know, chocolate tastes like, or, you know, who distinguishes between this cheese and that cheese. Um, and then I say, you're wrong. All right. No, you don't. You don't know what that tastes like. And I say, so, so if you think you do, do this, you know, you and your lab partner, you know, take out some cooking extracts. And we used to do this in lab where we'd have, you know, say vanilla extract. And I'd say, here, take a Q-tip, dip it in the vanilla extract. And while your lab partner is holding their nose, um, you put a, a drop of the vanilla extract on their tongue and ask, what is it, all right? And so, um, and it, by all means, feel free to try this with cooking extract. Your lab partner would say, well, it, it's wet or like maybe, you know, I feel burning a little, um, but I don't know what taste it is. And then when you let go of your nose, you're like, ah, oh, tastes like vanilla. Obviously that's wrong. It smells like vanilla. You could not identify what the taste was while you were holding your nose. So about 80% of what we think is our sense of smell really isn't your sense, I'm sorry, uh, your sense of taste, isn't your sense of taste. It's your sense of 
uh, uh, of a smell. So something doesn't taste like vanilla, it smells like vanilla. You don't taste the difference between this cheese and that cheese for the most part. You're smelling the uh, difference. Now, in addition to smell, other things are contributing to taste. So if something is greasy, like or slimy, you might not like the taste, but their texture is having uh, an input. Temperature can have an input. So, you know, warm beer versus cold beer, warm milk versus, you know, cold milk, warm pizza versus cold pizza. They taste differently. The molecules are the same, right? But temperature is contributing to taste. If you like spicy foods, you know, like hot peppers and the like, that's not actually a taste, that's pain, all right? So these, um, there are molecules in the, uh, the spicy food, which are triggering the release of uh, neuropeptides uh, like um, a substance P. So capsation in hot peppers can cause a release of substance P. That's what we release with pain. All right, so you know there would be a little bit of that. So taste, what we think of as taste is a kind of a composite sense, which involves smell and temperature and, and texture and, um, and, and pain even. Now, when I say smell, here's, I'll be honest, this is a word I just learned, retronasal olfaction, okay? So obviously, um, if you're going to put food in your mouth, you know, an odor can come from uh, here and go through your external nostrils and reach your olfactory epithelium. But we also perform retronasal olfaction. As you're chewing your food, then volatile elements are released, which can then pass up through the nasopharynx and reach the nasal cavity that way, okay? And so our oral cavity ends in the oropharynx. Um, but then that communicates with the nasopharynx. And so while most things are going down, um, we also then can have odorants. Once again, as we chew, we can release volatile uh, elements. Um, this then can pass through um, the internal narrows. That's what that opening is called. Um, and then uh, reach the olfactory epithelium that way. Okay. Um, and so... If you don't really taste vanilla or the difference between this cheese and that cheese or like all of the spices, you know, that's the nose. The nose is the one that's saying, oh, it's this cheese, it's this wine, it's this whatever. Well, then what's the tongue doing? What is the sense of taste doing? And let me just, you know, emphasize this. Um, the, the smell can be flowery, no pun in, in, intended. Um, you know, and oh, like the spices here are perfectly balanced. Great for the nose. The, the mouth is trying to be far more practical. If you put something into your mouth and you are thinking of ingesting it, um, you could make a mistake. Now, once again, like some of the things I'm going to say, that seems odd to us, but I just want to remind you of how different you are from your uh, ancestors. Um, when you want to eat something, you go to the store and you buy things which are, you know, edible. You know, almost, it would obviously, you know, something in the store if it's not edible, and that's obviously a very exceptional uh, problem. Um, so you know that you can eat that stuff, you know that it's healthy. Your ancestors had no such knowledge. They were starving and they were walking across the field and they found berries or they found a dead animal and they were starving and they then put something in their mouth. Now, if you put something in your mouth thinking of ingesting it and you've made a mistake that this is something which is actually bad for you, you can fix the mistake. All right, there are involuntary ways of correcting the mistake. You can vomit and you can have diarrhea, all right? So if you ingest something that you shouldn't, all right, there are ways of getting this out of your body. But while it is in your mouth and you are sensing the taste, this is your last chance for the voluntary where you can just spit it out and not swallow. And so when we look at the taste buds, that's what they're trying to do. All right, they're trying to help you with that very basic decision. Should you ingest this or not? And so the presence of vanilla or the balance of the spices, that's not important. You have basic questions which have to be answered. Is this good and you want to ingest it? Is it bad and you should spit it out? All right, so on the good category, is it sweet? Is it salty? All right, these are both good. Now, the reason that they're good is, look at this individual, all right? To walk, to run, or whatever, the energy which is required, 
I mean, just like energy contraction in general, just muscle contraction in general takes energy, but we're walking upright. All right, as opposed to, you know, like lizards, which are dragging their belly on the ground. So it takes a lot of energy to um, get us uh, through the day. Look at how hot we are. All right, so this is from like a little thermal uh, camera on a uh, winter day, as uh, you will uh, see. Um, but the body is 90, you know, eight degrees, give or take. And, and so our body stays hot, much hotter than the environment constantly. That's not cheap. It's not cheap to be 100 degrees in February. All right. And so therefore, that's an incredible amount of energy. Plus, you throw in the brain. All right. The brain is an expensive organ. That's why most animals don't have such large um, brains. They're expensive. Your um, brain maybe makes, you know, less than 5% of your body's weight, but uses close to a fifth, 20% of your body's energy. So you are expensive, all right? So you're, you're upright walking, you're 100 degrees all the time, you have this huge brain, none of that comes cheap. And what I'm about to say, I, I don't say this uh, lightly, um, the last UN estimates I, I, I had read, um, tens of thousands, maybe 40,000 people a day die of hunger or a hunger-related disease. So it is not easy to get the expensive human body uh, through a day calorically because we take so much energy. So if you put something in your tongue and it's sweet, you say, I like this, I want more because of how expensive it is to run the human uh, body. Um, if you put something in your mouth and it's salty, you say, I like this, I want more. Why? Well, because salts are determined by ions. Ions in solution are called electrolytes. They conduct electricity. And that's important because your nervous and muscular systems run on electricity. So without ions, then, you know, if we have an ion imbalance, if your sodium, if your potassium, if your calcium levels change, you die. If your blood calcium goes up by about a third, you die. Blood calcium goes down by about a third, you die. So if you put something in your mouth and it's salty, you say, that's good because I sweat away ions. I lose ions in urine, but I need ions for my nervous and muscular systems. So I like salty foods. One of the things I always like to remember is like the word salary, right? We'll do, we'll do work as long as we get a salary in return, right? Where does the word salary come from? Sal. Sal is salt. All right, the Roman soldiers, they could be paid in salt. That was the origin of the word. That's how much we um, value. That's the origin of the word salary. Um, so uh, sweet, that's a good taste. I want more. Salty, that's a good taste. I want more. Then there's sour. All right. Now, in my class, when I, um, I, I teach, when I had said, you know, your ancestor came upon a dead animal, you know, a lot of people just wrinkle their noses. Ooh, <laughs> we say, all right, fine. You can be picky because you know you have a refrigerator full of food. You know, your ancestors were starving. They came on a dead animal. That, that was a party maybe. But if you were to then take a dead animal and take a bite and it's sour, well, that tells you something. I, and I ask my students, what does that tell you? It means it's not fresh, right? So when is milk sour? When it's fresh? No, when it's gone bad, when it, it's been around uh, a while. And so sour uh, tastes, um, obviously complex. So, so things can be a little sour and we can like to, you learn to like sour things. Um, so some citrus fruits are sour and there's a value in uh, that. So like we need vitamin C and so citrus fruits can be a little sa sour like orange juice or limes or whatever can be a source of vitamin C. But strongly sour, that indicates things which have gone bad, which have been around for a while that's a good thing that's not to swallow, okay? And the reason for that is you're likely to get sick. The longer that something has been sitting around, um, there are now, you know, uh, uh, flies which are laying their eggs uh, there. There are bacteria which are producing toxins. Those flies might have carried the eggs of nematode worms on them. And while nematode worms aren't something we think about, uh, you know, that often. They are major parasites which limit the lives of, you know, millions of people throughout the world uh, each uh, year. And so if you eat something which is sour, then you're likely to uh, get uh, sick. All right. So that's a bad taste. Sour in the mouth, then can to spit it out. 
Same thing with bitter. Now, bitter tends to be more perceived on the back of the tongue. Um, and we have this one sense bitter, but a lot of different compounds trigger it. And so uh, those G pre protein couple of receptors, one will bind to molecule X and you know, stimulate the sense that this is a bitter taste, but a different one could bind uh, to molecule Y, but you still sense it as bitter. So you can taste things as bitter, but chemically the molecules are reacting to are completely different from uh, each other. Now, a lot of bitter compounds come from plants. And I hate to you know, change your view of the world, but plants don't like animals as much as we think they do. Animals eat the plants, right? And so um, plants would like animals to stop eating them. And if you're a plant, what could you do to get rid of these caterpillars, which are going to you know, take all the leaves off your tree? Well, you can't swat them away or you can't move if you're a plant, the only way you can defend yourself against um, an animal which is going to uh, eat you is to poison your leaves, all right? To make your leaves nasty so that any animal that's going to eat this plant all day is going to pay a heavy price for it. And so if you were to just walk through a field and say, oh, let me get back to nature. I'm gonna pick plants, put them in my mouth. You would spit them all out because of how horrible they taste. They're so bitter. All right, these plants don't want animals to eat them. So they're putting poisons in their leaves. And your tongue is warning you of that. It's telling you don't eat this plant. It's trying to poison you. All right, now, um, obviously, lots of things are somewhat uh, bitter. Lots of, you know, vegetables have somewhat bitter. And that's actually a problem. Like in our modern world, we should probably eat more vegetables and less, you know, pastries, um, especially, you know, children. But children don't like the bitter, you know, taste. Um, and so they're coming from plants, all right? Uh, and so that's why, you know, even in things like broccoli or coffee, it tastes bitter because there are carcinogens there. Now, not a lot. And I'm not saying that these things are bad for you because we do have a liver after all. And that's one of our liver's jobs to take, you know, the things which we've eaten. You know, when you eat a meal, it goes to your liver before it goes to, you know, your brain. And then your liver has all of these um, uh, functions, uh, which includes detoxifying many of these uh, these molecules. So I'm not saying not, don't eat, eat vegetables by any means. Uh, your liver can take care of it. Um, but we, uh, you know, we react to the, the bitter taste there, especially children, because children are more sensitive to taste. All right. So as we age, uh, we get fewer and fewer taste buds. So children are very sensitive to taste. So like you may, you know, give a child a salad with like iceberg lettuce, which is, you know, has no taste at all. And they're uh, uh, so bitter. Um, uh, but then as we age, you may notice you're putting more and more spices in your food or more and more hot sauce because it tastes bland. Our uh, taste buds decrease as uh, we age. Um, and so uh, therefore, uh, um, anyway, so, so bitter is a, a, a sense uh, for uh, molecules that are trying to, uh, to poison us. And so that's a bad thing. We, we spit it out and, and our tongue is protecting us. Um, there is another taste called umami from the, the Japanese uh, word for savory. Um, and so uh, beef, uh, monosodium glutamate, um, and, a, and a lot of uh, things have, you know, just this extra savory uh, taste. It's a, a, our fifth uh, taste and it's perceiving amino acids. So when proteins are broken down, they produce amino acids and we have a taste for that that's tasting amino acids and then to a lesser degree, other things like nucleotides. Um, now that's good because you need to eat protein, right? Out of these 20 amino acids, you can only make half of them. The other half are essential amino acids. They have to be included in your diet because you can't make them. And there's a couple where if you're a growing child, you can't make enough, those are the ones in yellow. Um, and so therefore, if you're specifically tasting amino acids and you taste it as good and savory and wanna eat more, that's a way of ensuring that you're going to have more uh, the essential amino acids that uh, you uh, need. Um, now, uh, those are five primary tastes. There is apparently research and some evidence that we can also detect fatty acids as a sixth taste. So that's not definite yet, but there is evidence which uh, suggests that fatty acids are also then perceived. So once again, going for energy sources, uh, fats are very uh, calorie uh, rich. So that would be a good thing to taste. So once again, unlike your sense of smell, which is what kind of cheese is this? Are the spices balanced? Um, your, no, your tongue doesn't care. Your tongue is simply asking, you know, if you're thinking of ingesting this, of swallowing this, is that a good idea or not? 
Is it good for you? In which case, like, it, is it sweet with the calories that will get you through the day? Is it salty with the ions that you need for your nervous and muscular systems? Does it have amino acids, you know, like the essential amino acids that your body can't make? Might there be fatty acids present? These are good things. I like those. I like that taste. I want to eat more. Is it sour? In which case, maybe I spit this out because um, I could get sick. Is it bitter? Is this plant trying to poison me? All right, and so taste is a, is a much more practical sense uh, than uh, smell in that uh, regard. Now, most of our sense of taste uh, comes from the anterior two thirds of uh, the tongue. Uh, and so the taste buds here, those uh, axons then form the facial nerve. So if you remember, the trigeminal nerve feels the face but moves the mouth when we chew, while the facial nerve, which I tell my students is like the evil twin, the reverse, um, it then feels the mouth in taste, um, but then moves the face. So facial expressions, the facial nerve, but feeling the mouth in taste. So the facial nerve is sensing taste on the anterior part of the tongue. Um, but then there are other cranial nerves which help out. So the posterior part of the tongue, that's where a lot of the bitter taste come from. That's coming from the glossopharyngeal nerve. But there can be taste buds more broadly throughout the mouth, the roof of the mouth, the throat, even the epiglottis, um, more so in children than in adults. And that's then uh, on the vagus nerve. So there are three separate cranial nerves which are um, uh, contributing to the sense of uh, taste. These three cranial nerves all project to the same area of the medulla, excuse me, the medulla oblongata. Uh, so, I'm sorry, I'll get back to you. Uh, so uh, the medulla oblongata, um, and there's a nucleus called the solitary nucleus. Uh, it kind of goes vertically up the medulla and taste is in the rostral, uh, the, a part of that, the upper part of the a solitary uh, nucleus uh, does, um, uh, does taste. So all three of these project then to, here's uh, uh, the medulla and the solitary nucleus would rise uh, vertically, but the, um, all three of these nerves would go to you know, the, the top end of, of that. And then from there they would synapse and then neurons would then go uh, elsewhere, uh, primarily to the ventral a posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus, the VPM. Most senses, except for smell, project to the thalamus and potentially other places in, you know, in the brainstem as, uh, as, uh, as well. And so if you move this orange nucleus out of the way, the black nucleus you know, behind it, that's the uh, ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus, gets the projection from the medulla. And then the um, uh, nucleus of the thalamus, the VPM, will project to what's known as the gustatory uh, uh, cortex. So in your somatosensory cortex, which is that post-central gyrus, so there's a big groove um, in the brain, the cerebro, known as the central sulcus. The fold behind that is called the post-central gyrus. And this is where touch, pain, and temperature are going. So there's a sp specific area for you know, the face, the hand, you know, the back, et cetera. But if you look here, um, that is the gustatory uh, uh, cortex where, uh, uh, where taste then goes from the thalamus. All right, so this is how the brain becomes consciously aware of taste as we get stimu stimulus in the uh, gustatory uh, cortex uh, there. So this is how taste uh, is uh, perceived by the brain. And note that it's a special sense. It's not perceived everywhere in the body, just uh, in the, the mouth and throat. And it's not projecting generally to this area. It's projecting only to this part of uh, the brain. So this was an overview of two special senses, smell and taste.